Welcome to an enlightening journey. This educational content offers challenging insights. Approach with an open mind. The link for the study guide can be found in the description. Subscribe to join the exploration. Let's dive in without wasting time. The Illusion of the Observer Chapter 1 Introduction The point of this essay is to inquire into the nature of perception and to determine the true significance of the role of the observer in perception. We will be concerned with the observer in his purest form, stripped of all emotions, experience, and memories. In attempting to define the nature and role of the observer, it is not my intention to add yet another theory to the countless many already in existence concerning the nature of man and the universe. My intention is to stimulate a deeper understanding of perception by throwing new light on an aspect of perception which is taken for granted, misunderstood, or denied. To better understand any process, it is necessary for us to understand the cause of the process. Because the observer is so deeply involved in perception, his presence is usually the last thing to be noted, if it is noticed at all. This is comparable to an analysis of the causes of sedimentation on the ocean floor, to which it is replied that the cause is the presence of the ocean itself. The reply has told us nothing, for if we inquire further as to how the presence of water causes sedimentation, we find a great number of different ways in which sedimentation takes place. And if we inquire further into the ways, we find that the cause of sedimentation in each case is different. In like manner, an explanation of the ways in which the observer is involved in perception is far from being an identification of a single underlying cause. A full understanding of the ways in which perception can be altered cannot be had without understanding the ways in which the presence of the observer can alter it. This is because the ways in which the presence of the observer can alter his perception are really the many ways in which he can alter the object of the perception, leading us to a consideration of existence and knowledge which will be touched upon at the end of this essay. And the understanding of how the observer can alter the object will give a deeper understanding of the nature of the object being altered. Definition of the observer The meaning of the term observer is not as straightforward as it might seem. More often than not, an observer is conceived as someone who watches or sees what is happening in the world. On a closer look, however, the word is not so simply defined. The Latin root of observe is observare, meaning to watch over or attend to. An observer of events in the world involves more than just watching. It involves a special way of attending to events. This particular way of attending is best understood as the process of evaluating and interpreting events. This evaluation is done in contrast to events one might engage in. This is an important aspect of observation. The observer makes a distinction between their actions and the actions of others. An observer also deciphers intentions and purposes behind events. This assignment of meanings to events and actions, that is, interpretation, is what distinguishes observation from sense perception. The type of evaluation that an observer engages in is reflective. It involves critical analysis and assessment. This reflection separates observation from intuition. Intuition is a rapid and instinctive way of knowing the nature of events without the conscious use of reasoning. Intuition can, no doubt, precede or succeed reflection on events to supplement understanding. However, Intuition alone cannot be considered observation. This is because intuition lacks the critical analysis that is essential to the nature of observation. A critical analysis involves determining the logic of events and the consistency between actions and their outcomes. This analysis is a search for understanding through making sense of an event. The observer believes that an event is intelligible and that through understanding it, one may gain knowledge of how things are and why they are so. Role of the Observer in Perception In the analysis of the various theories of perception, it is clear that all positions place the observer in an important and necessary role. However, it is not commonly agreed upon what the part the observer contributes and which are the responsible processes. Naively, it seems that to sense the world exactly as it is, is to have a direct perception of the world. 
This seems to be the paradigm of the realist conception of the world. However, this exactness and directness is ambiguous in its meaning and difficult to pin down exactly what this would entail. Moreover, when we come to parallels of such a direct perception in the world of modern physics, in particular in quantum mechanics, we find that this concept of sensing the world is impossible with various proofs. Instead of an exact direct perception, the onus turns to what can be said of the world from the observer's standpoint and what can be known of it. Thus, if we consider imagining two separate perceptions of the same event or object, it is always possible to represent them as two different states of a perceiver. The reason for this is that the perception of an event or object must be stored in some physical medium, and thus the differing perceptions are differing representations. Now, if we take an extreme case that a person is shown an object but immediately forgets what they have seen, it can be said that the object no longer exists for that person. This is because in order for the person to recognize the existence of the object there must be some change it makes on the state of his memory, and by hypothesis there has been no such change. Hence there is no way in which he can distinguish this memory state from the state in which the object had not been perceived. Such a case illustrates the necessity of some interaction between the object and the process of perception for the object to be perceived in any manner. The illusion of objectivity. When attempting to evaluate the properties of style and language when perceiving objects, we often feel that the observer plays the role of a silent, detached viewer, focusing his attention on an object that can be seen quite independently in the mind's eye. The feeling of objectivity is extremely compelling in such a situation. It seems quite natural to think that the qualities of such an object are intrinsically determined, and it only needs to be looked at rightly to yield up its secrets. There is little question that one is aware of the roundabout processes of inference and interpretation taking place in the perception of more elusive or ambiguous things. As when one watches a public speech, and knows that the face and words of the speaker are to be appraised in the light of ulterior motives, or perhaps are taken as symptoms of deeply seated collective psychological disturbances. But it is commonly supposed that these processes can be separated off from the immediate observation of the thing seen, which has a fixed and unequivocal nature of its own. The presence and qualities of an object are generally thought of as quite independent items, the former being the fact that it is seen and the latter a complex of specific attributes inherent in the object itself. The observer may alternate the range of his awareness between what is considered inner and outer part of the object. For example, when watching a criminal trial, he may take the defendant and his testimony as the inner data, revealed only in a reflection of outward words and acts. From this he can turn to the visual images he derives from the faces of judge and jurors, by which the characteristics of the aforementioned testimony are to be evaluated. But he feels that the inner and the outer data are two self-contained and simultaneous events, and may find himself somewhat embarrassed when he is asked to reveal exactly when the one event ended and the other began. This frame of thought, which separates events into neat little bundles of independent existence, applies itself to the objects of perception and it is an extremely useful precursor to the objectivist's point of view. Chapter 2. Factors Influencing Observation From this, positive and negative attempts have been made to change the perceptions of a society, perhaps to fix undesirable attitudes or to bring belief in a new understanding. Evidently, there are myriad factors influencing observation and a strong field of research for understanding how and why it occurs. With social influences extending to peer pressure, leadership, and the influence of society on individuals in a given situation, psychology has often sought to understand how knowledge and attitudes affect behavior in a given context. Our upbringing and environment also have a large impact on what and how we observe. The influence of culture on perception is a large area of interest to sociologists and psychologists alike. Culture is defined as a set of understandings, implicit or explicit, that a group of people share about the reality of the world around them. This includes attitudes to a given subject or situation, 
general understandings, and specific knowledge on a topic. As culture sets these beliefs on reality, it will interact with perception, as perception is the method by which we translate what is happening in the world. Thus, what is perceived by a culturally different person can be completely different to the same situation. Perception can also serve to reinforce cultural knowledge and attitudes, using it as a schema to understand and thus leading to biased interpretations on that subject. Given that culture is such an essential part of understanding what occurs in any society, many social psychologists seek to discover the general sociological factors which influence various culturally based understandings, also looking into how a given situation can be defined in terms of different cultural settings. This is related to the understanding of social context as culture is a global understanding of a group and it is regularities in life and it is an understanding of the way things are and the way they should be done. This social influence on culture is in many ways similar to culture's influence on perception and therefore shares some of the same processes. The degree to which we see reality and our observation are dependent on a multitude of factors. The dominance of what we observe being true has been diminished as increasing evidence that the shifting beliefs we hold on any given subject shape our interpretations of it. These interpretations are trailed with personal biases that greatly influence our observations from a subconscious level onwards. Biases in many guises are extremely prevalent in observation and are manifest in several ways, from selection of what to observe, to interpretation and memory. Cognitions are often simplifications of reality, but an excessively biased judgment will lead to illogical inferences of reality and the positive test strategies will lead searches for evidence to confirm our own beliefs, risking perceptions of what we need to observe rather than what is actually there. Subjectivity in perception. Perception, in everyday language, is associated with something that is directly experienced, and cognition is associated with thought processes about the experienced objects. This is a practical separation though one that has little to say about the relationship between the two processes. The separation suggests that acted upon or experienced objects are different from the perception of those objects. Cognitive therapy, for example, recognizes that negative automatic thoughts and core beliefs about an event can exacerbate depression. In this context, cognition is seen as different to the perception of the event, and it is thought processes about the event not the event itself, that is responsible for the emotional reaction. In the field of psychology, it is worth examining the ways in which perception and cognition are separated, as well as the ways in which they are independent. The distinction with perception and action is more straightforward. We perceive objects, events and people to gain information about them, and often to gain information about what to do with or to them at a later stage. Classic direct realist approaches to perception state that what is perceived is the same as what is an object or event. But it is generally agreed in the more modern understanding of perception that perception alone cannot tell us about the possibility of interactions with the object or the object's abstract properties. This brings perception closer to the idea of a medium for knowledge acquisition. In this modern understanding of perception, perception and cognition are synonymous with the acquisition and manipulation of knowledge using different methods. This understanding suggests that anything we do with the information gained from perception is also an aspect of perception, and anything that changes the knowledge acquired is a factor in cognition. But in this event action and perception cognition dichotomy, it is the case that all four are interactive, and there are no isolated processes. Cognitive biases in observation. Cognitive biases are deviations in judgment, inference, attribution, and reasoning. Biases are often a result of perception and reference, and can lead to illogical interpretation and, in the end, an invalid conclusion. They can still be held by those who have adequate intelligence, motivation, and time in order to draw an accurate decision. An observation may be biased which then leads to a biased interpretation of an uncertain attitude. 
The observers expect to see a certain interpretation of this attitude, so they will seek out tests that confirm this expectation. Finally, those observations may influence the person being observed to actually alter their behavior, thus making the biased interpretation a self-fulfilling prophecy. In the end, the prophecy's confirmation serves to strengthen the biased attitude. An example of this was a study into the overestimation of alcohol and illicit drug use in the British Army by psychiatric personnel. The personnel reported that the drug use was the main cause of the soldiers' behavioral and emotional problems, and went on to suggest that substantial proportions of discipline problems in the Army today are due to changes in enlistment standards and the involuntary induction of men who had been accustomed to civilian lifestyle tolerances of conduct that are no longer acceptable in the military. An alternative interpretation of the soldiers was not investigated, and the words today and involuntary induction were seen as coded references to drug use. This biased belief on the part of the psychiatric personnel led to more focused questions on drug taking from army superiors inspectors and an increase in disciplinary action regarding soldiers with drug and alcohol-related problems. This was all done in view of the personnel's belief that the soldiers with emotional and behavioral problems were self-medicating in order to escape present circumstances, which were of a lower status than civilian life. This provided a perfect example of a self-fulfilling prophecy, as the targeted soldiers changed their behavior to that expected of drug users, and with increased disciplinary action on drug-taking soldiers, it seemed as though there were more of them than before. This resulted in a disproportional allocation of resources to army psychiatry at the expense of other psychiatric services, and no attempt to discover alternative reasons as to why men had emotional and behavioral problems. Cultural and social influences on observation. People have a shared culture and belong to various social groups within that culture, such as a profession. Information can also be culturally biased. For example, it has been found that medical practitioners interpret identical alphanumeric symptoms differently based on whether the symptoms were with reference to a present culture or another culture. This evidence was supported by practitioners from cultures of Chinese, Middle Eastern, and Anglo-Saxon backgrounds. This indicates that even within a culture, other social groupings may influence cultural identity. In a study conducted by Nisbet and Suzuki, it was found that when shown pictures of a large fish tank, Americans were more likely to recall details of the biggest and most prominent fish, and Japanese students were more likely to recall details of the background and context of the picture. This indicates that culture can even separate the ways in which people of different cultures process the same information. Research has shown that people rely on knowledge stored in memory to construct mental scenarios of possible future events. Knowledge is predominantly cultural in nature, thus anticipated future events are likely to be culturally biased. Plus, on a more practical note, people find it easier to understand new information if it is presented in a manner consistent with their cultural beliefs. All these endpoints indicate that future events and interpretation slash perception of information are influenced by cultural identity due to it acting as a filter, which is applied to incoming information. Social context shapes people's perception and evaluation of their social world. Culture is the essential core of one's social identity. It provides the implicit knowledge about how to behave, what to expect from others, and what's expected of them in various social contexts. Humans don't leave home without it. It is common for people to grow up in one culture and live in another, and to be influenced by both. Culture provides the framework within which people are influenced by society. It provides the tools of thinking, seeing, hearing, and interpreting the world. These tools are influenced by the people's own cultural upbringing, and most likely are different due to an individual's cultural identity. Chapter 3. Limitations of the Observer Human Cognitive Limitations such as the inability of the individual brain to process all available information and its inherent hardwiring, would seem to be a more speculative and less observable problem in the study of the observer. 
Cognitive neuroscience and the study of the cognitive limitations of infants will be used as a means to better understand the limitations on cognition and their effects on observation. This will allow for a more sound analysis of the effects of cognitive limitations. Sensory limitations come in many forms ranging from the simple inability of some organisms to see due to lack of developed sensory organs, to the more complex, selective nature of human sensory input. It will be shown that some sensory limitations were of evolutionary benefit to an organism, but may have a negative effect when observing the natural universe as a whole. Color, and in particular, gravitational wave astronomy, will be used as a modern example of the gap between observable phenomena and the nature of reality due to sensory limitations. The observer is unable to observe the world as it truly is. There are factors, such as sensory and psychological, that limit human abilities to observe. The failure to recognize this has led numerous philosophers and scientists to erroneous conclusions and has caused Western man to have an exaggerated view of his abilities. An understanding and recognition of these limitations are essential in the reconstruction of a correct worldview. It will enable future generations to avoid the pitfall of current and past thinkers, while providing a sense of humility. This essay will examine the limitations of the observer and their effects on observation through a variety of fields. Cognitive Limitations the information overload principle of Simon, 1971, contends that there are limitations to how much information a human can process. This principle is similar to the filter theory of attention in which the mind has a limited ability to process incoming information. However, Simon specifies the limitation is not in the channel of information getting to the mind, but in the capacity of the mind to process and utilize information. The philosopher and psychologist William James once said, Everyone knows what attention is yet no one knows much about it. This is an interesting concept to consider seeing as attention plays a critical Sensory limitations Ashman and Elkins, 1990 Cited in Ashman, 1996 Carried out a study which gives a surreal indication of the effects of losing sensory abilities. Aged rats were either conditioned to run through a maze having been supplemented with ginseng, or put into a control group. After this, they were tested, and the conditioned group performed significantly better. Following this, the conditioned group were subjected to having their brain's ginseng receptors blocked, and were then tested again in the maze. Their performance was now no different from the control group. This concludes that there is a strong correlation between cognitive function and sensory input. In an unrealized future, where we may be able to enhance brain function, some type of artificial sensory input may be used to enhance interpretation and memory of data coming from experiments, with unknown consequences of how data interpretation may differ from that with normal sensory input. The human observer's ability to perceive their surroundings is truly extraordinary, but it is far from perfect. Our interpretational knowledge resides in the brain, which can only process meaningful information that comes from our senses. In result, our programming to interpret data ends up affecting the data that we are interpreting. We can see an example of this occurring with individuals with severely impaired vision interpreting colors as different levels of light, as this is what their brain's sense receptors translate the information to. This difference in the actual data and the perceived data, due to the limitations of visual senses, can have profound implications when trying to perceive information in the physical world, where it is vital that we are able to accurately interpret data from our senses. Similar to the fact that the man's illusion theory of reality is more real than real reality. This is due to the simulation having an interface in which the data can be interpreted and in a consistent state something not found in physical reality. This would mean that humans in the future of simulation technology would not be able to accurately interpret the real world, further showing the effects of the differences in perceived and actual data. Another example can be seen in the limitation of memory capacity for interpreting auditory information. This can only hold roughly seven pieces of information, 
with a span of 20 seconds. This gives issues of interpretation of data. Emotional and psychological factors. Unfortunately, Hoffman seems to have thought strictly in terms of hypothetical testing involving future advances in artificial intelligence. He makes no mention of the significant influence that work on visual perception can have when testing his theory. He has, in fact, explained that work on visual perception necessarily assumes the fake construct and has said that the construct is thus the proper target of neural and perceptual hypotheses. This claim opens up the possibility of testing perception and visual cognition by observing the mistakes and suboptimal function in the fake visual field. Although this takes us a step further from finding proof for the existence of the construct, the same researchers would say that the construct is our only handle on visual and cognitive processes in the normal environment. For if well-devised experiments can reveal a lot about visual cognition and perception, and the real and perceptual worlds are almost identical, Hoffman's group will be able to derive empirical predictions about the behavior of visual and cognitive processes in the real world and the fitness of creatures which employ them. The theory meets empirical tests. It possesses an exemplary scientific quality in that is precise and mathematical, yet also consistently testable. Hoffman and Singh, 2012, present the explicit algorithm of a conscious agent as an object prone to taking assumptions about its environment, and the evolution of such an algorithm can be simulated and quantified. Hoffman's group is currently fleshing out the full mathematical theory of conscious agents, and in some way or another, all opponents and supporters of the theory are attempting to use it to derive predictions. The theory is thus testable and is already meeting at least some empirical success. Hoffman's complementary theory of conscious states that human beings are only capable of observing or experiencing an evolved interface of sensory data. If the interface limited our interactions with the world to conscious experience, that would indeed explain the evolution of dualism and the mind-body problem in philosophic thought. On the contrary, however, this theory would also suggest that we should have no ability to observe data not essential to our survival or reproduction because any unnecessary sensory data would use energy and material without providing benefit, a costly waste in the evolutionary sense. Wint and Metzinger, 2007, argue that it would be a paradox for a system to evolve a complex mechanism that differentiates between conscious and subconscious data when the same system has no ability to observe such a differentiation between itself and other entities. If this is the case, then organisms should have no way of knowing which specific data is essential and which is irrelevant to their survival or reproduction, leading to a gradual accumulation of all observed data. Hoffman, 2014, counters this argument with the claim that so long as it is causally functional, an observer state need not resemble the environment it is observing and thus, as long as differentiation between relevant and irrelevant data is causally functional for survival or reproduction, the complex observer state can still evolve. Chapter 4. The Observer's Impact on Reality The assumption of an observer-independent reality is, in actual fact, limiting the potential of scientific inquiry. It restricts the study of causal relationships between the behavior of the observer and the observed. By assuming that it is possible for an observer to perfectly insulate themselves and an apparatus from external influences, one also assumes that there are no uncontrolled variables. This assumption is far from the conditions of experimentation in the real world. Usually, there are massive amounts of uncontrolled variables. By regarding the system being observed and the apparatus as an isolated system, the uncontrolled variables are assumed to affect only the observed system and apparatus, and not the observer. In actual fact, it is the data which the observer receives from interactions with the observed which give rise to the uncontrolled variables. Failure to accept this point leads to confusion and frustration in the attempts to repeat unsuccessful experiments. It also leads to denial when the results of an experiment are not as the scientist predicted. 
The scientists may blame the anomalies on the malfunction of the apparatus or the occurrence of unaccounted for interactions within the isolated system. An acceptance of the influence of observer and observation on the observed shifts, the scientific focus from the quest of gathering objective data to the study of interactions and the gathering of data which can teach us about these interactions. The fact that observation impacts that which is observed has been the longest issue among those argued at the foundation of quantum physics. How and why does the observer affect the observed? The old paradigm of Western science assumes that there is an observer-independent world, that there is a reality which does not depend on whether we perceive it. This assumption is the cause of much frustration and difficulty in the study of the nature of reality, because it has been assumed that observer independence is necessary for the scientific method. There has been no room in scientific theory for the study of the way in which an observer interacts with the world. This has led scientists to attempt to separate in their experiments the observer from the system being observed in the search for objective results. In general, it has been taken for granted that it is possible to observe things as they are, without any interaction taking place between the observer or the observed. This attitude affects the way in which a scientist must conduct his or her experiments. It requires that the scientist predict all possible interactions between the system being observed and the isolated apparatus with which the observation will take place. This is an attempt to control the interaction and allow only those which are relevant to the data being sought. Observer effect in scientific research. This can cause major problems in trying to convert scientific ideas to universal laws. If a scientific study involves the testing of a theory by observing a series of events with the aim of producing evidence, which will either prove or disprove a certain hypothesis, the knowledge that the observed events are subject to change by observation could lead to unconscious alteration of the events in order to conform to the hypothesis. The scientist, in effect, may end up creating his own reality in order to obtain the desired result. An example of this can be found in the field of parapsychology, where experiments to prove the existence of psychic phenomena often yield positive results. This is in stark contrast to experiments aiming to test other hypotheses in physics, and the results are always the same. This lack of replicability is evidence that the reality of the observed events in the psychic studies has been altered. This casts doubt on all scientific studies, as there is no way to determine whether a given result is a true representation of what actually happens. Scientific research involves the collection of data in a systematic and objective process in order to test theories. This idea is based on a model of reality where events are assumed to have an objective existence, independent of the human mind. As a result, the reality and the perception of the events being studied should remain unaltered. However, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, as well as recent developments in modern physics, are revealing a different picture. They are showing that at a fundamental level, the behavior of energy and matter is not deterministic and that the probability of an event occurring can be altered by the act of observing it. If we apply these principles to the world of macroscopic events, this interpretation of reality can have serious implications for the success of testing theories through data collection. If reality is in fact subjective to the observer and his mode of observation, then human perception of an event can change what actually happens, thus rendering the event an ambiguous occurrence with evidence that is open to interpretation. Observer's Interpretation of Events It has already been alluded to in section 2.1 and section 2.3 that events and objects within reality are not absolute in their form. They exist as a range of possibilities in their characteristics of which the observer selectively singles one out in an act of measurement. A commonly held belief is that an event within reality possesses one objective interpretation to the observer. This interpretation is said to be determined by the characteristics of the event itself, the interpretation being derived from an interaction with the event, guided by light reflecting from it into the eyes and information carried through other sensory devices.
all interpretations are then believed to be stored within the memory of the observer. It is then the job of the philosopher to explain how the interpretation of an event can differ between two observers. The realist would have to account for the difference in interpretation as a failure to correctly observe the true characteristics of the event. This account falls short in one respect, for if our first observer watches a film of the event at a later date and changes his mind about the film's content, it is then the characteristics of the event at the later date which our observer is attempting to interpret. If the realist were to admit that the event has gone through change by taking on different characteristics, he can only explain the film watcher's change in interpretation as a failure for him to originally and second time round observe the true event. This claim is unverifiable as any evidence of an event only exists for the characteristics it has yielded on those objects which have interacted with it. The film in question is one such object and therefore there is no way to compare the characteristics of the event then with the characteristics of the event now. Thus any change in interpretation of an event is indistinguishable from a change in the event itself. The claim is also unpalatable for it to admit that any slight change in an event will result in the failure of all observers to correctly interpret the true characteristics of that event. Any event in reality can be viewed as a very complex object and any interaction with it will only yield partial information about its characteristics. The constructivist view provides a more satisfactory explanation for the difference in interpretation of an event between two observers, and also for an observer's change in opinion about an event. Observer's Influence on Social Constructs To understand the observer's influence on social constructs, one must recognize first that the reality we aim to discuss is comprised of inner socially fabricated interpretations of other people's beliefs of reality also known as socially constructed reality. This concept, briefly stated, means that the beliefs of these individuals form the way they interpret their own reality, even if that interpretation is itself a false one. With this in mind, an individual can be said to have been able to influence social constructs if their own interpretation of an interpretation causes a change in the general consensus of exactly how to interpret that particular version of reality. An example of this could be an individual who perceives the view of an old person being something of a hindrance to society, thus changing the way a large number of individuals in the society perceive the role of pensioners. Taking the above example, it has to be understood that the effects one man can cause on a social construct can be inadvertent on his part. Given that the man comes to believe the stereotype of pensioners through various events involving elderly persons, it can be said that this increased exposure to a particular version of reality will shape his interpretation of it. This changed interpretation will lead to changes in his behavior towards elderly people, which in a social interaction sense is his redefining of how to behave with the elderly. This changed treatment can then cause various reactions through elderly individuals also being exposed to this behavior, thus creating a chain of events which can reinforce the original stereotype or create a new one. This man's initial influence has been the cause of a change in the social construct of reality regarding the status of elderly people. Chapter 5. Overcoming the Illusion of the Observer Overcoming the illusion of the observer is a fundamental goal for the reflective thinker. To achieve the same, the thinker must focus on ways to close the gaps between actual and perceived self-awareness. Being self-aware enhances our behavioral choices, promotes congruence, and allows for changes in behavior. By becoming aware of the discrepancy between our observing and participating selves, we understand how our private biases influence our perception of the world. This, in turn, enables us to sharpen the focus on our assumptions, inferences, and interpretations of events and stimuli. The process of becoming aware of these mental constructs is a key strategy to overcoming the illusion of the observer, as it allows us to understand how we filter and ultimately misperceive reality by not considering the meaningful alternatives. A vast amount of research has been undertaken on social cognition, and though all theories differ, at their core is an inquiry 
into how we process the information that comes from our social environment. Social cognition theory is useful for the reflective thinker as it has an emphasis on the automatic nature of our thinking. That is, much of our information processing and resulting beliefs are unconscious or out of awareness. Although automatic thinking can be efficient and useful, it can also lead to systematic biases. By further understanding how our automatic thoughts form conclusions and attributions, we can gain a clearer picture of how our unconscious beliefs affect our perceptions. Developing self-awareness Though it may be difficult to refrain from making assumptions, it is definitely possible to develop self-awareness. Doing so requires a conscious effort to be aware of one's thoughts, feelings, and behavior. Such awareness is the foundation of the mental process that leads to the overcoming of the illusion of the observer. Techniques for developing self-awareness are diverse and include journaling, meditation, and cognitive therapy. The common thread between these techniques is the intentional focus on increasing awareness of the self. Journaling can be completed by writing about one's daily events and one's thoughts, feelings, and assumptions about those events. Then rereading the journal and analyzing thoughts and assumptions can lead to increased awareness of where those thoughts and assumptions came from. Meditation, particularly mindfulness meditation, is also a practice of intentionally focusing on the present moment and increasing awareness. By focusing on breathing or bodily sensations, one can become more aware of the mind's tendency to wander into automatic thoughts and assumptions about reality. Cognitive therapy involves working with a therapist to identify and change thought patterns and assumptions that are causing distress or unhealthy behavior. By doing so, one can become aware of the nature of assumptions and thought patterns and begin to find where they originated from and how they affect feelings and behavior. These techniques and others like them can be effective for developing self-awareness and ultimately overcoming the illusion of the observer. Practicing mindfulness in observation. In the same way that we cannot experience an event exactly as someone else experienced it, we cannot fully appreciate the process of how we perceive. However, as cognitive scientists, we can attempt to approach that understanding by being mindfully aware of our mental processes. The study of the first-person experience is something that has been somewhat overlooked by Western science, but practicing mindfulness in meditation has provided some interesting results from a first-person perspective. Mindfulness is the practice of paying attention, on purpose, to the present moment and without judgment. An eight-week course in mindfulness has been shown to increase the gray matter concentration in brain regions involved in learning and memory processes, emotion regulation, self-referential processing, and perspective taking. These results were in participants' self-reports of their mindfulness in everyday life. Learning to meditate mindfully on self-observations can be difficult as we tend to take interest in the observed object rather than the process of observing. The tendency to take interest in the observed object is deeply ingrained in us because we are conscious of that object due to it serving some purpose to our goals. Often we are not conscious of the process of how we perceive something due to it being successful when nothing is out of the ordinary. Nevertheless, with practice, meditating on self-observations can produce insights on the process of self-referential thinking and break the automatic habit of relating all perceptions to our own ego. Headspace is an interesting mindfulness training tool, which uses a guided meditation approach that teaches how to observe thought in a non-judgmental manner. The tool begins with a focus on the breath and body and later moves on to observing mental processes of the body. An experienced meditator can then effectively observe thinking as a stream of thoughts that is separate from the ego. This method of decentering has been shown to produce significant reductions in negative effect and increases in positive effect, rumination, and worry and is a process that is evident in talks with advanced meditators from various traditions. An example from Western psychology is an experience sampling technique and its use in cognitive therapy, where under the guidance of a therapist, a patient learns to observe a particular mental process 
and its effects in daily life. This mode of therapy is similar to the cognitive interviewing of a witness's mental context in that it is an attempt to bring an automatic cognitive process into the focus of metacognition. Seeking diverse perspectives. First, consider an individual who unwittingly offends someone of another race in a mixed group of friends. If he is aware in the back of his mind of racial prejudices and dislikes, the likelihood is that he will interpret the event in a self-serving manner. He will consider only his intentions, may deny that he caused any offense, or be inclined to blame the oversensitivity of the other person. Such post-event attributions by self and other are setting for this person a reality of the situation which is at odds with the perceived reality of his friends and especially the person he has offended. If the man truly desires to know himself to see if he is prejudiced and to understand the true impact of the event, he can invite his friends to honestly share their differing perceptions of a single event. By comparing and contrasting these views, it will become clearer that there are many so-called realities of the same event, depending upon the viewpoint of the observer. This will lead the man to question the nature of reality in this instance, and the disparity between it and the various perceptions of the event at the different viewpoints. Diversity of perspective is another method to help individuals overcome the illusion of the observer. In seeing a single event from more than one viewpoint, it becomes far more difficult to hold on to the belief that observation can take place from a neutral vantage point. There are at least three ways in which seeking diverse perspectives can help to dismantle the illusion of the detached observer. All are based on the simple idea that when we see a situation from more than one angle, it becomes hard to maintain that one of these is the true view and the others are distortions of reality. Chapter 6 Implications of the illusion of the observer. Observation is unavoidable, but being aware of the implications of what is being observed is important. Those being watched are very often aware of the fact and may well feel uncomfortable being under scrutiny, particularly if the results of the observation are to be made publicly available. This can have a serious effect on the behavior of the observed, as rather than simply watching natural behavior, the observer is effectively altering the reality of the situation being observed. This is a common problem in interviews or the study of group behavior. The arrival and presence of the observer can alter the nature of the group itself. An extreme example of this can be seen in anthropology. The study of foreign cultures can have unintended results if the observed peoples begin to change their way of life in order to try and emulate their observers. Ethical considerations in observation. There is also potential to cause damage through the misapplication of knowledge. Influential studies often have a very large audience and many people may take the findings and apply them inappropriately. A contemporary example would be the research which suggested a link between MNR vaccinations and autism. This was later proved to be false, but resulted in many people avoiding the vaccination for fear of their children developing autism. The avoidance of vaccinations had a detrimental effect on herd immunity. Ethical considerations in observational studies and findings present the availability of knowledge to make ethical questions particularly acute. There is the potential for the researcher to abuse the knowledge of a particular situation or of certain behaviors of groups of people to the detriment of that or those individuals or groups. This could be by using such knowledge to unfairly exploit a situation. An example of this could be a study on a medical professional's treatment of patients from different socioeconomic backgrounds. If the practitioner got to know of the findings, it may affect his future treatment of patients. Moreover, the knowledge may be kept secret when it should be made public. Impacts on decision-making processes Daniel Wegner suggested that the automation of action identification resulting from goal-setting failed in unpredictable settings. However, it is posited that a decision-making process is not a predetermined course of action aimed at creating a known goal. It is simply what comes before an action in which goals are often vague and there is an absence of a well-defined decision to make, or a decision that there is little conscious awareness of. If this is the case, then Damasio's 1994 
link between somatic markers and conscious awareness of emotion would suggest that when making many decisions, we are only becoming aware of a decision having been made based on what we feel is the right course of action. Any impact of the illusion of the observer on decision-making processes would be expected to alter the criteria on which a decision is made, rather than the outcome of a decision. This is because decisions can only be identified by their outcomes, and there is no reason to assume that an observed or unobserved state of mind differs in the outcome of an action. One potential impact of the illusion of the observer on decision-making criteria is that it would lead to an increase in the complexity of criteria employed. Wegner suggested that an increase in accessibility of the reasons behind an action increases the belief that a certain state of mind was the cause of that action. Stepansky and Hamilton, 2006, suggested that bringing an action under conscious control requires a self-regulatory check for the permission to act approach to any conduct that is about to occur. Both of these theories would suggest that the decision to perform an action is based on a conscious judgment of whether it is the desired action to take. Importance of critical thinking skills. As it was previously mentioned, there are many cases where an observer must make a decision with no true guideline as to what to do. This can be from deciding how to behave in order to gain the best acceptance from a group under study, or what to take note of when studying a particular phenomenon. The observer will never have an understanding of the correctness of the decision, although it may have varying influences on the research. In this case, it would be highly beneficial if there were tools designed to aid optimal decision-making in uncertain situations. One such theory is the use of heuristics. Critical thinking can be well understood or applied to any underlying concept involved in research. This is because critical thinking focuses on an endpoint which may be a decision or belief. The aim is to ensure a clear, logical, informed decision that is free from bias or subjective influences. This makes critical thinking a highly valuable tool for it, is an essential element in producing a well-thought-out conclusion. In the basis that all research has an endpoint, it is easy to see the value of critical thinking. Compare this to decision-making under uncertainty, which is common in observational research. Critical thinking and the ability to make logical and well-thought-out decisions are both highly important and serve as vital components in studying complex behavioral phenomena. The concept of critical thinking can be a difficult process and has intrigued many prominent theorists throughout the ages such as Plato and Descartes, to name a few. In order to understand the importance of critical thinking, a full examination of the ways in which it can be applied to the field must be made. Chapter 7. Conclusion I have argued that the suitably refined conceptual framework for the subject as observer would have to be so greatly altered as to be unrecognizable. At the heart of the illusion is the idea of an ultimate observer, an intelligence who is, as it were, the author of the universe, the creator of the world, and all its inhabitants. An intelligence and an associated framework of concepts which, although they may sometimes fall short of the appropriate level of refinement, is nevertheless forced by the very nature of the quest into that purview. The sort of intelligent being that we describe as an observer in the everyday sense is by no means the correct concept for the quantum domain. As is well known in the orthodox approach, the notion of such an observer is inextricably linked to the idea of an observation, which can be assigned a specific time and a definite outcome. But the grace of the quantum dynamics is to describe the evolution of system states from a set of initial states, and the functional mechanism that is the process is not in general uniquely decomposable into a set of time histories for subsystem observations. To attempt to force it to be so is to interfere with the system in an uncontrolled way. The project of developing a consistent and adequate framework for the subject as observer thus involves trying to bring about a union of two pictures of the world. In one, a continual meshing of the fabric of the universe is taking place into a holistic network of tangled and ever-changing configurations with high degrees of symmetry and correlation between many variables. In the other, 
There is the story of the evolution of a special kind of subsystem through a sequence of relatively well-defined and distinct configurations. It is in every case a mistake to idealize the subsystem as an isolated entity with an environment consisting of some quite other kind of subsystem. But the mistake of idealization can be made less or more serious in approach according to the particular choice of variables used for the description of the subsystem. The an observer picture is fundamentally the attempt at an idealization coming from postulational choices of a very sharp distinction between the system and environment, and of variables for the system with a very strong law of correspondence to the variables of classical sequential cause and effect. As soon as a framework attempt approaches the quest of containing refined formulations of symmetry and field concepts for the meshing fabric of the universe, it will begin to lose the postulates which set the an observer picture apart from the usual structure of dynamics in field and many body theories. However, in doing so, it will also begin to lose the definitive marks of what constitutes an observer. The subsystem idealization will cause the concept to become vacuous. For at every stage where there has been the semblance of a definite observer activity, it can be asked, why does this not look more like a simple event in the evolution of the field? And the variables chosen for the observer subsystem can always be reinterpreted as bringing information about global field activity. The content of what makes the observer special will always seem to slip away to something simpler to identify. The symmetrical field variables will possess alternative formulations which are quite more compact and easy to transform into one another. And the correlation of the observer variables to these field alternatives will form a partial and dissipative information. At this point, it is unmistakable. The observer has become a more general kind of system, and the whole possibility of a unique time history for high information with a definite outcome is a story of cheap victory against an environment of poor rivalry. If you found this content enriching and valuable, we would be deeply grateful if you could express your appreciation through liking and subscribing. Your support is incredibly meaningful and enables us to continue creating content that resonates with you. For those who think this is a great gift for yourself or for your loved ones, you can find the link in the description.